In this episode of Presidential Leadership Lessons for the Business Executive, we take a look at the career and presidency of William Howard Taft. Who are our greatest presidents? What lessons can the modern day business leader learn from our 46 chiefs of state? Find out in this podcast series with Tom Fox and Richard Loomis to delve into the great and not so great presidents to mine their successes and failures for today's business executive. Hello, this is Richard Loomis, and I'm here with Tom Fox for another episode. We're continuing our series on presidents today with the 27th president, William Howard Taft. He's probably best remembered today for his corpulence or maybe for being the first president to throw out the first ball of the baseball season, but his record of public service remains very impressive, and in fact, it was entirely unknown to me prior to researching this podcast. He's the only man to have served as both president and chief justice of the Supreme Court. He was born in 1857 in Cincinnati, Ohio. His father was a lawyer whose work for the Republican Party led to political appointments that brought him increasing social prominence. And President Ulysses S. Grant eventually summoned him to Washington, first to serve as Secretary of War, then as Attorney General. In the 1880s, he was sent to Austria-Hungary and later Russia as minister. Much to his wife's delight, the couple lived abroad and indulged their love of travel. That was carried on in William Howard's life as well. He went to Yale, got a law degree, and served as a judge in Ohio while also being a loyal and enthusiastic Republican. At the age of 33, he was appointed U.S. Solicitor General. This was his introduction to the national scene and to progressive politicians such as Theodore Roosevelt. Two years later, as a U.S. Circuit Judge, his efforts to make the judicial system responsive to the needs of a changing society drew President McKinley's attention. And at the time, McKinley needed somebody in the Philippines to manage the civil government for the new U.S. possession. He named Taft, who left for the Philippines in 1900, immediately clashed with the military governor, General Arthur MacArthur, father of Douglas MacArthur, and William sought and obtained MacArthur's removal. Following that, he drafted the island's constitution, which included a Bill of Rights, nearly identical to the U.S. Bill of Rights, established a civil service and judicial system, English language, public schools, and health care facilities. His lifelong ambition was to have a seat on the Supreme Court, but he turned down President Roosevelt's offer of a Supreme Court appointment twice while he was in the Philippines so he could finish his work in the islands. Roosevelt had, of course, succeeded McKinley when he was assassinated in 1901. Roosevelt's offer of the judicial appointment may well have been an attempt to preempt him as a presidential candidate in 1904 because his work in the Philippines had attracted a lot of favorable attention. He appointed Taft Secretary of War, in 1904, and Taft became his presumptive successor since Roosevelt had promised not to run again during the campaign. Taft's opponent in the general election of 1908 was William Jennings Bryan, Democratic nominee for the third time in four presidential elections. Bryan argued that he was the true heir to Roosevelt's mantle as progressive. Corporate contributions to federal campaigns had been outlawed by the 1907 Tillman Act, and Bryan proposed contributions by officers and directors of corporations be similarly banned or at least disclosed. Taft was only willing to see them disclosed after the election and tried to ensure that officers and directors of corporations litigating with the government were not among his contributors. So you can see that some problems have remained intractable in the last hundred plus years. In the end, Taft won by a comfortable margin of 321 electoral votes to 162. However, he garnered just 51.6% of the popular vote. His wife, Nellie, said regarding the campaign, there was nothing to criticize except for his not knowing or caring about the way the game of politics is played. This proved a recurring theme during his presidency. It marked a real change in style from the charismatic leadership of Roosevelt to his own belief in the rule of law. And there was a tariff bill where the Republicans felt that he had betrayed them by increasing tariffs. The only place that he had worked on it was on the Philippines, where he got them reduced. He instituted dollar diplomacy to Latin America, the occupation of Nicaragua, was involved in the Mexican Revolution occurred during his term. He continued and expanded Roosevelt's efforts to break up business combinations using the Sherman Antitrust Act, bringing 70 cases in four years. 
whereas Roosevelt had brought 40 in seven years. He clashed with Chief Forester Gifford Pinchot over conservation because although Taft was a cons- felt he was a conservationist, he thought it should be accomplished by legislation rather than executive order, again showing some controversies in the U.S. are timeless. His record on civil rights was at best mixed. He, he agreed that he had claimed that he would not appoint African Americans to federal jobs where this would cause racial friction, which simply encouraged Southern Republicans to protest against black employee, employees and to have to remove, remove most of them in the South. As Roosevelt became more radical, Taft became convinced that he had to seek renomination, even though he did not like being president because he was convinced that the progressive movement threatened the very foundations of Republican government. Roosevelt then formed the Progressive Party, also known as the Bull Moose Party, and Taft went down to defeat in the 1912 election. He retreated to teach law at Yale until he was appointed Chief Justice by Warren Harding in 1921. The court's decisions were generally conservative, but the Taft court laid the groundwork for the incorporation of the guarantees of the Bill of Rights to, against the states using the 14th Amendment. Also, during the Teapot Dome scandal, the Taft Court held that Congress had the authority to conduct investigations and issue subpoenas as an auxiliary to the legislative function, something else that still has echoes today. In failing health, he wrote his brother Horace in 1929, I'm older and slower and less acute and more confused. However, as long as things continue as they are and I am able to answer to my place, I must stay on the court in order to prevent the Bolsheviki from getting control. He was afraid that Harlan Stone would be made Chief Justice and refused to resign until he received assurances from Herbert Hoover that Charles Evan Hughes would be the choice. He died in 1930, just a month after his resignation from the court. Tom, this guy's career was far more extensive than I had known. What did you think about his career in life? Richard, a couple of things. First of all, I sheepishly admit I knew almost nothing about William Howard Taft other than he was incredibly corpulent throughout the first baseball (laughs) and succeeded Teddy Roosevelt. I knew even less about his pre-presidential career. And that's what struck me the most, Richard, was his pre-presidential career. You highlighted his work in the Philippines, and I cannot emphasize to our listeners enough how impressive that was, literally to go into the Philippines, not as a benevolent dictator, but as real moving, helping to move what were then thought to be backwards people towards a self-determination. The Constitution, he wrote, incorporating guarantees of liberty, similar to the Bill of Rights. He made clear there would be no discrimination He had native Filipinos not only work for him, but with him, and they were not discriminated against in government offices, buildings, or in hiring. Almost revolutionary for the time. I was very impressed by that. Also, his focus on Asia. He was one of the first uh, prominent Americans to focus on foreign policy, or had a foreign policy with an Asia focus. Obviously, Matthew Perry and the opening of Japan had occurred some years prior, but he clearly had an East Asia focus, which I had no appreciation of. But also, we touched on this with many of the presidents prior to the Civil War, that there was a meritocracy in America that was not like any other country in the 19th century. And we saw numerous presidents who rose to prominence. I suppose we could go back to Alexander Hamilton, not by sheer brain power or work, by people recognizing their talents and sponsoring them in many ways. Now, they did have brain power and they did have hard work and work ethics, but it all contributed to bringing people forward who were the best of the best. And Taft certainly appeared to be that. He, he, I was a little unsure because one of the readings we did indicated to me that he was a child of privilege. Another indicated that he came from a much more middle class background. But whichever it was, to me, he rigorously studied, rigorously worked after receiving an undergraduate and a law degree and sitting for the bar exam and really trained himself with a variety of government positions leading up to his work with the Roosevelt administration. So I was very impressed with that. The other thing that I have to point out for our listeners, we're going to link to some of the research that we did in the show notes, but there was an article by the National Park Service 
that I found fascinating, and it focused on William Taft's uh, boyhood home and how where he lived in Cincinnati and how he lived really facilitated a learning of service and government service and service to the country. And if you've ever been to Cincinnati, there's a series of bluffs. And living on a bluff typically meant that you were a little bit better off. And although the Taft a boyhood home is large. It's not a compound or by any means a mansion, but it sat on one of these bluffs. And he went to very rigorous schools and his parents were very, particularly his father was very demanding of him and drove him to succeed as well. We don't really talk about geography as an influence on leadership as perhaps as much as we should. So I was very gratified from this National Park Service article, and they really went into in a very deep detail what it was like in Cincinnati that down to the platting of the streets around his home, which yeah. I found just fascinating. So if you have some time, check out our show notes. But really struck that Taft was part of the meritocracy. And he was clearly seen as someone with talent. He was appointed to positions, I think, probably patronage positions to start with in the state of Ohio. But then he was brought to the United States, the United States government, to be Solicitor General, which is the third most important position in the Department of Justice. At the age of 33. At the age of 33. So he was clearly recognized as an up-and-comer, and he fulfilled, I thought, all of his roles up to the time of president pretty well. So it really struck me about his early work. Also, one thing I don't think we've really touched on in this podcast series is it was pretty clear his wife wanted him to be president. And indeed, one of the articles that we read went so far as to say she wanted to marry a man who would be president. And while we talk about the cycles of history in American history repeating itself for those who know anything about Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, you may say that repeated itself. But she clearly pushed him. And she did not want him to become Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. She wanted him to become President of the United States. And he did. The role of his wife, Nellie, I think played a very big part in his arc, story arc. He was devoted to her. They were married for 44 years. I found that really interesting as well. I did too. And in fact, she was responsible for the planting of the cherry trees, which I thought was interesting. Yes. And she was also the first first lady to own and drive a car, support women's suffrage, and smoke cigarettes. I thought it, uh, Taft was, of course, the butt of a lot of jokes for his obesity, including, but he seemed to have a good sense of humor about it, although he did struggle with his weight. And he suffered from sleep apnea and would often fall asleep in meetings, which I think must have. Uh, injured his performance but i think the big problem with his performance is that he did not he was not a good politician didn't really want to be one he wanted to be a lawyer and emphasize the rule of law and that of course while the foundation of our republic is not necessarily a popular opinion i'd like to touch upon that for a moment richard i think most of our listeners know we're we are both lawyers we have that professional background in common and the role of a politician is very different than a role of a lawyer. And indeed, although many politicians are lawyers, to my understanding, there's a clear dichotomy in how your mind works from the role of a lawyer in practice as a role to as opposed to a politician who has a legal training. And Taft had a lawyer practicing lawyer mentality, and you're absolutely right. And he did not have the political skills and he followed one of the most popular presidents ever, which didn't help either. And charismatic. And charismatic. And, and I tried to think of another example, and I thought about Anthony Eden following Churchill. I'm not sure that's fair to either Eden or Taft. But Taft was, was the obvious choice to succeed Roosevelt, and there, there really was no one else on the national stage. Taft had been successful in the Philippines. He had been successful as Secretary of State under Roosevelt. He had Roosevelt's ear. He had Roosevelt's confidence. He would have seemed to be the natural successor, but the skills Taft brought to bear were obviously very different, and the uh, the focus of his administration was different. And we have touched upon succession in this podcast on leadership, but your successor is going to be different than you simply because he's not you, and he may have a different focus. And 
you, know, you have to let it go once you let it go and that uh, your successor may take things in a little bit different. It's interesting because one of the articles we looked at said that Roosevelt's wife didn't like his association with Taft because he felt that they were, she felt that they were too similar and that there was no benefit in getting advice from someone who believed in all the same things you did. One of the jokes was that Taft stood for take advice from Teddy when he was running for president, and it was thought that he was going to be Roosevelt's man, but he wasn't. Once he became president, he absolutely broke with Roosevelt over a number of issues, not least of which was the what Taft regarded as the excessive use of executive orders in preference to legislation. So, I, yeah, I thought that was an interesting lesson as well, the relationship between mentor and mentee and how it changes when you pass on the succession. I, mean, I guess we could all go back and do read King Lear again. But There were some things, though, that I was really interested in finding out about his presidential term, Richard. The tariffs and the reciprocity that, that you talked about, that really ties into what I saw was his focus on East Asia. One, because he was willing to waive tariffs on the Philippines, but he really had a series of initiatives around East Asia. And as I mentioned, I thought he was the first U.S. president to have an East Asia focus. He didn't stop immigration from Asia, and that was a huge objection on the West Coast. We talked about that in some earlier podcasts, but he did grant broad reciprocal rights to Japanese people in the United States as well. Additionally, the Latin American focus, I was, I just thought we were kind of Teddy Roosevelt to Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, but Taft had a much more nuanced approach to Latin America. He was the first American president to go to Mexico, and he met with the then president Diaz at the start of the Mexican, who's president at the start of the Mexican Revolution. He put together treaties with Panama and Colombia to resolve the Panamanian Revolution. He did engage in dollar diplomacy, but it was, a, I thought, a, a nuanced difference from what Roosevelt did. And then in Europe, he tried to uh, do away with a uh, practice of simply rewarding uh, wealthy donors who wanted to live a lavish lifestyle while they were in key ambassadorial posts. So I thought that was interesting. Also, he supported settling international disputes by arbitration, obviously a very legal perspective, but something that came to the fore under Roosevelt and Taft tried to push. He was unable to really get that agreed to by the U.S. Senate. So I thought there were some interesting points. You mentioned, uh, mentioned Gifford Pinchot. Any environmentalist will recognize that name. And I hadn't really been aware of the Hunter Pinchot affair and what led to Pinchot's resignation. But uh, I found that interesting as well. Yeah, no, that was interesting. I knew nothing about that, although I had studied Pinchot's career, I guess, sort of desultorily, but uh, right. when I was studying environment and ecology in college. One of, one of the articles we looked at had some interesting quotes from him that I thought were had real application and as leadership lessons. And the first one, I think, is is an interesting way to phrase it. It's don't write so that you can be understood, write so that you can't be misunderstood. And in our days of tweets and emails, I think that is a real important thing to keep in mind, that distinction. The other thing that he said was that enthusiasm for a cause sometimes warps judgment. I would say always, just the way it goes. It's difficult to see the other side when you're that enthusiastic about a particular cause. So, Richard, I guess the in the final or at least final thoughts for me are, one, this is someone I really did not know enough about. Perhaps the overriding lesson for me was around succession. <clears throat> the Everything you said about mentor-mentee and once you become, you move on as the CEO, you have to let the, the new CEO, you have to let them do whatever it is they're going to do. But the bigger lesson for me is the best and the brightest may not be the person who should be your successor. And it really struck me once again that Taft was the, really the only choice for Roosevelt, at least in the Republican Party at that time, unless he was going to go all out and put in Bob LaFollette or something. And I don't think that was going to happen. But Taft was the logical choice. Years ago, the Republican Party talked about resume. Taft had as strong a resume of government services, uh, probably anyone you're going to see, up to the time of George Bush the first, and it was very impressive. He had done extraordinary things throughout a variety of administrations and situations, but when it 
he became the chief executive, it was a different role, and it was a role that he was not constitutionally sorted to do. And I don't want to call his presidency a failure, but when you run for re-election and you garner eight electoral votes in two states, Utah and Vermont, that is a pretty clear statement by the electorate that they thought somebody out there was better. When you think about succession, I think you have to think about yep. more than who is simply the best and the brightest. It's who's the best person to fulfill this role going forward. I think that's a great point. The other thing, that, which I assume we'll get into in more depth when we discuss Theodore himself, was the question of whether he really resented having promised not being able to run a second election. It would have been his third term. But I think that may have been involved. I think he may have ultimately resented Taft for a mistake that he himself had made. Very true. I think that Taft's well, for one, he was president during an incredibly consequential period in American history with the transition into the progressive period, and his term ended as president when Woodrow Wilson came in, I guess possibly the most progressive president we've had. So in in one way, he uh, he furthered the progressive cause, which he was ultimately opposed to, although I found that his jurisprudence was also much more uh, nuanced than I had believed. I had thought he was totally conservative and his judicial philosophy, but a couple of the decisions we mentioned earlier show that he was not and uh, was very much open to increased civil rights and a supervisory role of Congress. On that note, I would like to thank you all for listening. This is Richard Lomas and Tom Fox. We hope you'll tune in next time from 12 O'Clock High. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership. If you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Please check out our research for additional reading. If you're interested in finding out more about William Howard Taft, we found the research for this podcast fascinating. I hope you'll join us again for our next series of episodes. We're going to take a deep dive into Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States. I know you will enjoy it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode, and we look forward to visiting with you again. 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership, is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Presidential Leadership Lessons was recently awarded by the communicators as a podcast of distinction, and we're certainly thrilled to have won that award. Also, I would like to invite you to another podcast I recently concluded called Never the Same, which looks at business issues which have changed forever in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 